What's up, friends? Mike Roll coming to you live from the Loftus Studios. High above Highlands Bible Church in beautiful Vernon, New Jersey. Welcome again to the Mike Check, the podcast where we seek to strengthen the church to make a stronger defense of the faith by biblically checking the unbiblical. Today on the podcast, we welcome Mrs. Naomi Mason, author of the book Enough. We're going to talk about why we feel like we are not enough, not blank enough, not thin enough, not rich enough, not whatever enough. What the Bible has to say about that. And we will do that right now. So let's go. Well, Naomi, thank you so much for joining us on the mic check. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you doing this. I know all about you, but there are some out there. I mean, I probably have upwards of four or five listeners now. Big time. Wow. I mean, yeah. So maybe for them, okay. tell them a little bit about yourself, a very brief kind of background, family, history, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so... Not too complicated. I was born out on Long Island, okay, uh, Huntington, Long Island, and then when I was three, I think we moved to Flushing. Okay, let's go Mets. Let's gotta, go. Gotta say it, builds character. <laughs> I um, was a fan. Eighty six, man. I was there. Oh, I was there too. Nice. Yes, and I'm a diehard. Um, I lived there in Flushing till fifteen. I was fifteen years old. I I graduated from junior high school. Okay. In um, and Flushing, and then we moved to Sussex County, uh, New Jersey, which was a bit of a culture shock for me at age 15. Okay. Um, took a while to get used to cows on the corner, but, <laughs> you know, we did it. And then um, I married a Sussex County native in 1993. Wow. Yeah. So Did we, you have to pass a test or anything to get let in Sussex County yes. or, or marry someone from Sussex County? Was there Oh yeah, there's a def- fee of some kind or... Yeah, it was like a hazing, actually. <laughs> Going on the school bus for the first time in 10th grade was a little scary. Um, yeah, I stuck out. I did. But that's okay. okay. It's okay. So, But I did marry a native, yep. and uh, he thinks that he rescued me from, oh, from okay. the city, but it's okay. Right. Um, we've been married over 30 years, and God that's has... That's great. Yeah, yeah. Congrats. We are 30 this year as well. So. That's right. Very yeah. cool. Very good. And um, so what else do you do? What else takes up your time these days? <laughs> of course, I know all of these answers. You but. do. <laughs> um, well, we've been blessed with four sons. Yep. They're, all, they're all adults now. Um, and one daughter-in-law. It's a new era. There you go. Era. Yeah, a wedding There's, happened yes, relatively recently. That's right, yeah. November. So now that I do have another woman in my life. Okay. <laughs> you finally have a daughter. I, I finally have a daughter. It took 30 years of marriage. <laughs> nice. um, she's brave to join our family. <laughs> um, yeah, so the boys took up a lot of my time, and um, we moved around a bunch, but we've, we've ended up in Orange County, New York, for... The last 22 years, which, okay. which was amazing. We moved probably six times in our first eight years of marriage. Oh, my goodness. I never And thought, that was all Matt's fault, right? It, it was, yep. yeah, Good. because he was moving up his, his work ladder, yep. you know, yep. and um, we just bounced around. But um, I never thought we'd be here more than three years. That was our longest yeah. stay. So Some boxes just didn't get unpacked. Right? Exactly. <laughs> there are still things missing. <laughs> Um, but here we are 22 years later and, um, yeah, it's been, it's been great. Good. Um, I've worked as a social worker, case manager okay. before children. Okay. Um, I worked in Christian homes for children in Hackensack, New Jersey. Okay. And then I worked for Bethany Christian services. Yep. And then I worked as the house director over at Birth Haven Maternity Home okay. in Newton. Um, and what happens when you work at a maternity home? You get pregnant. There, so, oh, yeah. so, this is probably all around you. Yeah, right. So, so okay. that was, I worked right up until I had our oldest, Caleb, and that was wonderful. But then I stayed home for a long time mm-hmm. with the boys. Um, so that was great. It was a privilege to be able to do that. Good. Um, but then in uh, 2009, the wonderful economic downturn mm. uh, caused a little um, concern for my husband's job. So right. I, it was at that point when I asked, you know, if you want me to start putting my resume out, honey, I'm, I'm happy to do that. 
I had asked him that many times before. He never said yes. He was like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. 2009, when I said, do you want me to put my resume out? He said, I think that might be a good idea. He said yes. <laughs> and I, on the inside, I panicked, right? But I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so I started working um, in early intervention as a case manager okay. there because two of our four boys had had early intervention services, so it was a natural for me. Gotcha. Um, and I loved it. You could work from home. You could make your own hours. You could have as many cases as you want. Okay. And so for five years, I, I did that, and I felt like it was God's gift to me, that job. I loved it. And it got us through that kind of crucial time. Matt did not lose his job by the grace of God. He stayed on. Mm -hmm. um, everything worked out. And then um, two of our boys were struggling a little bit in school, and I felt like I needed to back away then and be home again for a little. Yep. So I stepped back and, and was a stay-at-home mom for a while. And um, then COVID and COVID. <laughs> COVID. And after yeah, that happened, <laughs> after COVID, um, I started looking again. Mm -hmm. And I, now I've been really excited to be at Sussex Christian School working there. For Sussex, the I've heard of them. Yeah, have you now? I think I've seen you there <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a couple times. So too. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you do a great job there as well. So definitely valuable and Thanks. definitely something that's needed as well. And to see uh, people, especially Highlands folks, right, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. see you guys serving. In the gifts that God has given you, it's a special blessing. Yeah. So it's been great. Sounds good. All right, we're back. Well, actually, they don't know we ever left. Yes. And I'm going to edit this out so nobody's ever going to know anything. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So, Naomi, Naomi I am holding uh, your book, which is aptly titled Enough. And so, tell us a little bit about, about the book. Why, what compelled you to write this book? Why this book now? What 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 message do you want somebody to walk away with after oh, reading this book? Goodness, that's a lot of questions. I know, I know. All in one. I'll do I my know. best. Um, <laughs> wow. First of all, it it is a result of COVID. Um, yep. The book okay. just came out of COVID. COVID was so strange for everybody in so many different ways, right? Yep. I found myself um, at home all of a sudden with my boys who had been away at college okay. back um, <laughs> everybody back under the same roof. Everybody back. Where did so, you come from? And why is there so much laundry? Yes. <laughs> and, and how did you get so big? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we had four, no, three of my sons were, were doing college remotely. Okay. And, uh, my one son was still in high school, um, all remote work. And my husband was now working also remote now. My house, oh my goodness! Yeah, my house was not is not big. Our our property is big. Our house is not big. It's normal. So we literally had people on computers doing work all day long. Yep. And I found myself like I can't cook because I can't make noise in the kitchen. <laughs> I can't clean because I can't use the vacuum. That's noisy. Yeah. Um. I was like, okay, what am I going to be doing? Yeah. And so I really felt like everybody else is studying and doing work. Um. The Lord put on my heart. Finish your master's degree, mm -hmm. and then I want you to write a book. Okay. So very strong impression. Did I hear an audible voice? No, I did not. But I just had this impression. I had started my master's probably two or three times before, okay. right? Yep. Never got to finish it just because of life. Yep. Another move, another child, another uh, that job. That life thing always gets in the way. It really did. <laughs> um, but then I saw, you know, and I thought, okay, Going back to school is going to be hard, but look, I actually have my three boys doing college at home. They can show me how to do college on a computer because mm -hmm. I went to class and I <laughs> went to the library and I used those little Dewey Decimal cards yeah, when I yeah. was in college. This, this was different now. Very different. Um, so I was, it was with fear and trepidation. But you know what? They said, why not try it? Mom will help you. My husband was like, yeah, go for it. He, he was so supportive. Okay. So I, and I was so much closer to finishing than I realized. Um, Good. So it, it really didn't take long. So by November, I think, I don't know, of 2019 or 2020, now it's all running together, I was done. Wow, great. And so there it was. I'm like, okay. And Did then, you start to write the book at the same time you were finishing up or you waited till you were done? I didn't start writing, but I did have uh, moments of, like, let's say God given inspiration during mm -hmm. the time when it was mulling around in my 
uh, my brain. Okay. So um, I did. I had a lot of notes, hand handwritten notes. I'm old school. I would come back from you know taking a walk or going for a run, and I and I'd feel like, oh, that's a great chapter. Oh, that's a really great chapter title. And then I would write these things down or other verses, yeah. you know, that meant a lot. And yep. so once the <clears throat> the master's degree work was done, I just started um, to write. Okay. I, I started to put down those thoughts into my computer and a manuscript and write. And then, you know, um, it came much more easily than I ever, ever thought it would be. Okay. Um, and I just, you know, it's my story, right? People, people want to know what my book is about. It's about my story of always feeling inadequate, mm-hmm. no matter what. Um, never good enough, never fast enough, never smart enough, never thin enough. Mm-hmm. Um, just that constant feeling of, you know, oh, you're okay, but you're just not quite there. You know, mm-hmm. you'll just never be good enough. Um, just from different circumstances in my life, mm-hmm. like I felt, I felt like that was a, a mantra that kept popping up for me, and um, and rather than turning those feelings over to the Lord, I was owning those all my life, and mm. I, I just let them get to me. Like I let that part of, well, you're never going to be good enough, just take over. Yeah. Um, and so that is what I felt like I needed to say because, um, right. Spoiler alert, we aren't ever going to be good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is, <laughs> the big reveal. The big reveal. Right. Um, We're a few moments in, yeah. and guess what? There the answer is. to the question is, <laughs> you're right. Um, you are not enough. <laughs> I'm not enough. I, I'll, never, I'll never be enough. And, and it all started to, to make sense, um, right? All my Christian upbringing, I was raised in a Christian home, um, I, I was in Sunday school all my life, church all my life, mm-hmm. and I always heard the gospel message. I knew what the Bible said, mm-hmm. right? We all have sinned and fall short, right? I knew that in my head. Yep. It, it didn't, I didn't internalize that, that, mm-hmm. that those struggles with inadequacy, those feelings that I was never going to be good enough, right? That was my sin. Yeah. That was that void that only God can fill. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that is the story of the book. Hmm. In a nutshell. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have read your book and I enjoyed it. I thought it was excellent. Thank you. I've also heard you speak on it as <laughs> well at the uh, one of the ladies' events that we had here at Highlands. And it is a very important message. Um, I think that, as I'm sure we'll talk about, every human being struggles with that mm-hmm. to some degree or another. Mm. Um, for some reason, I don't know, just in my experience, it seems to be perhaps more women struggle with that than men in different areas. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think maybe the men just kind of push through and bear down and yeah, it's there, but I'm not going to worry about it. And, and I, it seems to be more of women struggle with some of these uh, feelings of uh, I'm not blank enough, mm-hmm. but that could be a generalization. I'm not really sure. Um why do you think that is, though? Why do you think most people struggle with uh, feelings of inadequacy? Um, I think I touched on it a little bit, but I think there is a void inside every one of us, mm-hmm. and that void is um, something that can only be filled uh, by God. I think it is it is our desire to know God, and yet um, instead of turning to God, we try to look for some other way to fill that void. Yeah. Many, many times. And it, yeah. it can be work. You know, there's workaholics that yeah. just try to find their identity in their work um, and fill every waking hour yeah. f- with their job, it, whether or not it's for money, but it's that feeling of purpose, right? right. I think there's other people who do try to fill that void with money. Um, there's people who fill it with alcohol, drugs, yep. pornography, whatever. Um, yep. And it doesn't go away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's almost like, now check me on this, right? It's almost like God himself put something in our hearts where we could never be completely satisfied in ourselves or else any of the other gifts. Lord, there has to be that there's still something missing kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's him. I don't know. I think so. I think you're onto something there, Pastor Mike. (laughs) I think that's exactly what it is. It's It's our yearning to... To be back with, to our heavenly Father. Yeah, 
I do. It, it, that yearning versus um, the idea that we are the be all and end all of our lives, yeah. that we are independent, right? Yeah. That, that yearning for autonomy, yeah. that yearning for I am the sovereign Lord of my own life. Except for the glaring fact that life has a way of reminding us time and time again that we are not right. the sovereign Lord and ruler of our lives. That's absolutely true. <laughs> if yeah. we would just return to him, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so uh, a few times yeah. in the book, I noticed there was kind of a pattern. Uh, you struggled with the effects of harmful words mm. uh, that people had spoken to you, mm -hmm. you know, whether they be family members or teachers in some cases, or uh, doctors. I remember the story about the doctor. Yeah. Right? All of yeah. that and her comments about your parenting. and. Oh, yeah. Oh, goodness. A couple different times with doctors. The one doctor about my weight when mm. I was uh, right there hitting puberty that yeah. kind of pushed me towards an eating disorder, at least a predisposition towards an eating disorder. Yeah. And then years later, the doctor who told me <clears throat> that I was a nervous parent and yeah. that my child's developmental disabilities were really just my fault. So, yeah, yeah, just, oh, yay. You know, if you just <laughs> lightened up, your child would be fine. I just laughed more and smiled more. Um, it would all go so much better. Right. Yeah, yeah it didn't, didn't work, by the way, just, <laughs> just to let you know. I smiled so much and tried. Pro tip. Yeah, didn't, didn't work. So words are, words are hard, right? And I've, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, those that silly rhyme, where, uh, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Well, that's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. words yeah. words can, they linger, right? They yeah. just, you they resonate. And my tendency was to just ruminate over them uh, in my mind and let them get yeah. to me, right? Instead of yeah. just give them to the Lord, I would just r ruminate over them. And um, so many Proverbs, right, speak of the power of words. Mm -hmm. um, and... That helped me to realize I needed to be very careful with uh, the words that I speak. Yeah. You know, more, That's more and more. That's such a big takeaway, right? Because mm -hmm. we, you know, it, it's that connection and all of those examples in your books, right? Those were influential people. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, a parent or it was a friend or it was a doctor, doctor. or someone in authority, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we have to realize yeah. that as, as parents or you know, even as pastors, like the words that we use have yeah. tremendous mm -hmm. effect. Right. So many. And, and sometimes the deepest wounds we have are from people that are closest to us. Right. And the words are some of the some of the uh, biggest weapons. Yes. That are used either knowingly or unknowingly. Correct. Sometimes right? you can just say it by accident, let it slip out almost as a joke. And but you have to be aware that it may not be taken that way. Right. You know, and um, right. I, I just I, I try to remember when. When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Yeah. Um, the Proverbs. And, and there's so many. A gentle answer turns away wrath, right? Mm -hmm. When I um, work with the kids at school, especially, mm -hmm. I find myself um, over and over trying to tell them how careful they need to be with words. Yeah. And I am so careful with my words. Um, yeah. One of the scariest verses in the Bible, right? Jesus tells us that we will give an account for every careless word that we have spoken. Yeah. And it's like, you think about that, like, oh, no, 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 I'm good. I'm covered in grace. Like, that's not going to happen. Right. But the reality is, right, words are just like everything else we have. We're As Christians, right, we won't be judged for our sin. Right. That's on the cross with Christ. Mm -hmm. But we will give an account for what we did with what God gave us. Correct. And God gave us words. He did. And yeah. so how we use those words, we will certainly give an account as far as were we, as, as Scripture reminds us, full of grace mm -hmm. and seasoned mm -hmm. with grace, mm -hmm. were we speaking words of truth, were things helpful and kind, kind. all of those things from Ephesians, Ephesians. right? That we building remember, others up. Building yeah. others up, right. yeah. Were yeah. they Or were they harsh? Were they malicious? Mm. Were they tearing down? Grumbling. Grumbling. <laughs> Grumbling. Oh, is that a sin? Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> oh. And then there's the whole thing about James. Like, James is my absolute favorite book of the Bible. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I memorized Martin Luther would want a word with you about that. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> well, when my oldest was a tiny baby, I memorized the entire book of the Bible of oh, James. That's, like, it's such a practical book. It it's is so good. Yeah. And like almost all of chapter three is about the tongue. Yep. Right. Who and can tame the tongue? 
No man can tame the tongue. Yep. It is a restless evil, full yeah. of deadly poison. It's like a rudder that steers a powerful ship, right? right? The spark that sets fire to the whole forest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I learned that lesson personally, too. So, yes, it's in the Bible. We know these practical things, but but words did hurt me. So, yeah. Um, I'm well, that's, that's important for us, and, and hopefully our listeners, right, to hear that yeah. we do have to be very, very careful with our words mm-hmm. uh, because... Words matter, and especially words from people that we value deeply or authorities in our lives. Like how we interpret those words, how those words affect us, could have tremendous effects on our on our lives. Yes. Right? yes. Ergo, your book. My, like yes. Yeah. You know, some of those things they got put together in your mind, mm-hmm. and then it seems like it snowballed. And yeah, you know, you working through some serious things, and the Lord brought you through them. But yeah. how much different may that have been in different degrees? If those words are different. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll never know. And that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. We'll never know. And that's and okay. That's okay. <laughs> right. Um, one of the things, and you already alluded to it, or you said it, um, was that you struggled with an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. And that is so uh, prevalent today yeah. um, in, in so many ways. Yeah. Um, you know, we have social media, of course, that contributes to... Yeah people's minds of our people's perceptions of what people should or should not look, look like, like. Mm-hmm. right? You have mm-hmm. celebrities, of course, that influencers yeah. and things, and you have all kinds of whatever. Yeah. It's everywhere. Diets, yeah. diet plans, exercise plans. It's, it's everywhere you look. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that is, can you talk a little bit about that? Your, your journey with an eating disorder, um, yeah. you know, how that was obviously, would you say that was probably the the most major thing that you went through yeah. of all the things you, you talked about in your book? I think so. I think that was, well, yeah. I mean, because that's basically how I hit rock bottom. Okay. Um, and, and it's truly an addiction, the, the whole eating disorder. And I think the seeds of that eating disorder were sown when I was quite young um, and also in a home where dieting was always happening with my mom. Okay. So there was always... Yeah, I remember that in the book. You said whatever diet was, you know, the grapefruit diet yep. or the Atkins diet Atkins, or the... <laughs> yeah, the Dolly Parton diet, the Weight Watchers, anything, you know, my mom tried. And um, so so I was just always... That was always in the forefront of our house, too. And uh, and and pressure to always look our best. Okay. Um, so... And then <clears throat> after we moved to Sussex County, which was in itself... Tra- traumatic, Mm -hmm. right, for a 15, 16-year-old girl, Mm -hmm. Um, then things just kind of spiraled um, after that move. And uh, in a world that was very out of control for me, um, Mm. I learned that I could control how much I ate and how often I exercised. And that... um, so that it comes through a desire to control is what I'm hearing. It, it can. And yeah. I think as I look back, that was a very big part of it. Um, I didn't set out to have an eating disorder. You yeah. know, it, I honestly did not. I was just trying to, you know, be good enough. Right. In any and every way that I could. Right. Um, and so, you know, you lose a few pounds, you get some verbal praise. Wow, you look great. Wow, that looks good. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. And it's that it feeds that. Okay, wow. If five pounds could do that, oh, I wonder what a few more could do. Yeah. Right. So, so it was just that. Okay. And then the next thing I knew, I <clears throat> didn't have control of the diet anymore. Mm. It had controlled me. Wow. Um. And and I didn't find Boy, that. Isn't that a picture of sin? And, and yes. And, and really idolatry, right? The idea of, yeah. you know, we go to something because we think it's going to give us control, yeah. but then we realize. It's been flipped, Mm -hmm. and it is controlling us. Absolutely, yeah. Then I I don't know when it happened. I don't I don't remember. But senior year was pretty bad, and it's senior year of high school, um, and I just remember being just totally consumed with thoughts of food and diet and calories and exercise, and um, that I couldn't not think of those things. You know, yeah. it's like the alcoholic who's always thinking, when am I going to get my next drink? Yep. It, I would literally wake up in the morning and think, OK, when is what am I going to eat? How, yep. you know, and and just can't continue that way. And it was very unhealthy. Obviously, it was a distraction from 
everything else that was going on around me. If I mm. if I only thought about food, I didn't have to deal with anything else, mm. you know. And so would that's would you say that that is, you know, if you were looking for kind of warning signs or something of, so would you say something that begins to consume your thoughts mm-hmm. is probably yes. red flag number one? Huge red flag, yeah, huge red flag. Um, <clears throat> and that and, goes for any, as you said, right? It could be the alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, when am I going to get my next drink? What is it going to look like? Where am I going to get it? Yeah. Um, it could be drugs. It could be food. It yeah. could be fill in the blank, right? Yeah, it could be anything. When am um, I going to get my next business deal that's going to make me X amount of dollars? Dollars, right. Um, yeah, that's and that's what it was. And that's exactly what addiction is, right? You start, You don't start out to become an addict. Yeah. All of a sudden you are one. And, um, and it's a scary thought, right? I just realized one day that I was so consumed with these thoughts and I didn't know how to ask for help, number one. And I didn't know how to get out from where I was. Mm. Um, and, and it got really bad in high school. Then at the end of my senior year, I did end up, you know, passing out in one of my classes. Um, I was in denial too. Like at that point I was knew I had a problem, but I didn't realize how bad the problem was. Yeah. Um, and I base there's a lot of eating disorders. I basically just restricted food and increased exercise. Um, I didn't binge. I didn't purge. Mm-hmm. I, I just didn't eat much mm-hmm. at all. And um, so, yeah, you can't deny it when you're on the floor in your sociology class, oh, right? Um, getting um, wheeled to the Lord nurses. has those ways of getting our attention, right? Yes. So you were... Um, you knew it was a problem before then you kind of hit that bottom mm. almost literally right? um, before yeah. you almost literally hit the floor right yeah you knew that that was a problem yeah. even you're consumed by it yeah you knew that the tables had turned mm-hmm. that it now had me yes. that I wasn't controlling yet mm-hmm. and you were trying trying to well what can, what do I do right like you kind of that's a very lonely feeling it's a very desperate feeling when you're like what do I I'm stuck here but I don't know how to help myself I don't and as, as, um, and you kind of keep going in the pattern cause that's what, you know, that's what I knew. I knew how to do it and I knew how to do it well. And, and, um, you know, the obvious answer was, well, you just have to eat. Right. But right. that didn't cut it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so as much as my parents would be like, just eat. Um, were your parents aware of what was going on by this point? I guess when you passed out, then every, the jig was up the at that point. Was- my mom had known before, at least she, she was worried before she was making comments, uh, before my dad was, um, aware, but not really involved. Uh, so he, he really worked a lot, um, all consumed with work, but Mm. they were concerned. Um, and then of course, when they got the phone call from high point that I had passed out, then it was just kind of like the big white elephant that nobody could yeah. ignore because there it was, now right? We, now we're going to deal with this. Yeah, it's... yeah. You know, and then, of course, I went to, they took me to the doctor, and yeah, there were things off in my blood work. There were mm-hmm. things that weren't quite right now. So um, it was a little bit more uh, important to deal with, right? Because yeah. it was having sure. it was having effects on my body, on yeah. my... so. Um, I did. I did enter an inpatient hospital stay right before graduation from high school. Okay. Um, which was awkward. Um, I wanted to go to my graduation. Yeah. And they did. They did let me out um, okay. on that day, which was which was great. It it was awkward though because kids knew too that yeah. in school. So so it was just strange. Um, and it's. I don't know. I mean, you're only 25, so it couldn't be yeah. that long ago. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm thinking back to my time in high school. I imagine now, mm-hmm. right, 2024. Mm-hmm. I imagine if you say you're struggling with an eating disorder, that is a much more common thing mm-hmm. than when you and I were in school. Absolutely, we're probably about the same age. Yeah, right. You when you and I were in school, it's it, it comes from probably a far worse stigma. Yeah, back then. Yeah, it was very different. It was it. it I stuck out. You know, um, yeah. and although there were other girls that I came, I came to find out were also struggling with it. And uh, there were five of us on my tennis team wow. in, in my senior year. So, yeah, Gosh. I know one of them actually I was inpatient with for no, actually, actually two of two of them were inpatient at the same time. 
Um, and one was the, our school valedictorian. Mm. So, you know, typically these profile, we were all trying to be super good. Yeah. Very driven. Very driven. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, to our demise, literally yeah. to, to our demise. Cause uh, you know, um, our focus was wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm kind of trying to draw a biblical parallel here, and I know that's probably somewhere mm-hmm. on our question list. But, yeah. you know, looking back on that right now, you, you've gotten through this. There are, you know, uh, is what is what is the, the biblical parallel or looking back on your that situation, specifically the eating disorder? Mm-hmm. What would you say that you were looking for biblically? Like now that you're smart, right. you know, <laughs> established, yeah. you know. Um, years removed from this, maybe a better way to ask that question would be, what would you tell Naomi yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however many years ago, yeah. biblically? Like, what are what are you looking for? Well, I, I was looking for a savior. Mm-hmm. I was looking for someone to get me out of the mess, right? It's, it's the parallel to sin, right? Sin is yeah. in all of our lives. It may not be as drastic as an addiction, mm-hmm. right? Um, or it may be, I, you know, but we're looking for a savior. And I knew the Lord. Yeah. I knew I had such great head knowledge of the Lord. Um, and I had seen him work wonders in the lives of many people of our family and our congregation. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have that personal, that heart experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really didn't get it until um, my second mm-hmm. hospitalization because, you know, the first hospitalization just I did everything I had to do to get Imagine out. Imagine it was a blur. It, yeah, it yeah. was, and I didn't want to be there. And so they told me I had to eat and go to therapy and gain a certain amount of weight before I could leave. Check these boxes. Yes, and that's exactly what I did. So six weeks later, I was out, and I was like, yep, yeah, I'm good. We're, we're, we're okay. We're going to be fine. Yep. And two years later, I was back in the hospital. Mm. So the difference was... Um, the, the first time I went in, I was only 17. So I was under my parents. Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, gotcha. they, they put me in. Yep. I didn't want to be there. The second time, I knew I needed help. Mm-hmm. I knew and I wanted the help. Mm-hmm. I wanted so much to get out of that hole that I was in. Yeah. And um, so I said, I'm going back to the hospital. And my parents were like, mm, it didn't work. Why are you doing this? And I said, no, I, I know what I need to do. I know it. Yeah. So I want to go back. And they were, again, we looked at a couple other eating disorder facilities because they were all full. <laughs> go oh, figure. Oh, man. Yeah. So there was waiting lists for all of them. Um, and we went to a couple. And I went, no, I want to go back to St. Clair's. I want to do that one again. I know, I know the program. I know what mm-hmm. I have to do. And I know that I can do it. And, oh, by the way, I don't want you to come and visit me. I don't want you to be involved. Yeah. I need to do you it for do me, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that was the big difference. So, yeah. So two years later, when I was 19, I went back in. It made a much bigger difference. I could not stay as long. Insurance had changed. Okay. I only got four weeks in. Okay. Um, so I did not meet all the benchmarks that I should have met to be medically discharged. Okay. But um, I knew it was risky, but we... I left after four weeks and found a Christian counselor to work with as an outpatient Mm -hmm. um, and did so. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's when the hard work really began. Uh, So that mental battle, because sin is a mental battle, right? We've often seen the movies with the little devil and angel on on your shoulders, right? And we know that those are really just inside. That's inside our minds, right? There's always that temptation to do what the flesh wants, and then there's always that knowledge of what God wants us to do, and and that doesn't always seem so rewarding, right? Yeah. But it is. It's so much sure. better yeah. uh, in the long run. And so that recovery, then the outpatient, is a, is a mental process, and it's really just the battle with sin, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't have to be an eating disorder. It could be your battle with swearing. I, you know, it could be anything, but mm-hmm. we all struggle with certain issues, Um and I, I just so, so benefited from the Christian counselor who kind of walked with me and gave me much um, different, different view and, uh, of, of our Heavenly Father and how yeah. his view of me yeah. um, changed well, I mean, everything. I'm thinking of our previous conversation a few moments ago about words, mm-hmm. right? Right. 
And to understand then through that process mm. that our Heavenly Father is the most important entity mm -hmm. that can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And what does he say about you? And he loves me. Yeah. And he delights in me. Yeah. Right. And these are things that are in his word yep. that I had read time and again, but I hadn't taken them to heart. Yeah. And um, and that's his message, right? His, he created us in his image. Yeah. We bear his image. And he knows me so intimately, more than I know myself. Yep. And it's his desire for me to grow in his love and grace yeah. and not wallow in my sin. Yeah. Right. It's almost like the essence of idolatry, right, is we give preference to the other voices mm -hmm. instead of our Heavenly Father's yeah. voice. Yes. Like, like what he says about us, mm -hmm. we should believe, and it should be uh, definitive for mm -hmm. our, our lives. Mm -hmm. It should carry the most weight, right? That idea, of the Hebrew idea of glory, right? It should carry the most weight mm -hmm. in our lives, what God says about us. Yes. But yet the essence of idolatry and sin and false worship is we give these other voices mm -hmm. uh, preference. Right. And we listen to them. Yes. And we follow that song and follow that voice down whatever path that is, whether that is an eating disorder right. or alcoholism mm -hmm. or alcohol abuse or sexual promiscuity, or, yeah. you know, you keep going down the list, right? Yeah. That, that we follow that voice. And yes. the whole time, imagine our father is over there going, no, 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 listen to me. Right. Don't listen to them. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're going down the wrong path. Yes. Anything we put before God is an idol. Anything. Yeah. No matter what. Yep. And then the idea too, of course, we, you know, bringing it to the gospel, mm -hmm. right? The idea of Christ died on the cross for us to be forgiven, mm -hmm. for us to be reconciled to the Father, mm -hmm. and bringing that to bear on that idolatry, mm -hmm. right? Repenting of that and saying, nope, I listened to those voices. Yeah. And instead, I should have been listening to you. Yeah. And throw yourself on the mercy of Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's that repenting, that word that you just said, repent. It means to turn. Yep. To turn yep. from that way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, what a graphic illustration that is, right? Turn around. Right. Like you're you're walking again towards those voices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Turn around mm -hmm. and walk towards your heavenly Father. Yeah. Who speaks truth. Yeah. Right? And he calls us by name. Yeah. He's yeah. calling us. And those voices, right? The the deceiver is behind those yeah. voices. Yes. Our enemy is behind those voices. Absolutely. The father of lies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um one of your one of my big book truth takeaways, <laughs> the idea of the truth statement, right? The big idea. Truth is this statement. No, I learned I would never be enough or I would never be enough in my own strength, mm -hmm. right? That was kind of a big watershed moment for you, mm -hmm. right? When you realized, well, it's right. I, I am not enough. Right. Was that freeing in that moment to realize that was it like you finally faced it's almost like you faced that biggest fear mm -hmm. because you're up until then like anyone who struggles with anything of this sort mm -hmm. are saying i need more blank or i'm not enough blank or i'm not enough whatever yeah and then to stare that in the face and say yeah i'm not enough right it's terrifying and freeing at yeah. the same time i think i remember sharing with the women mm -hmm. um here that that feeling of yeah, I'm, I'm never going to be enough. Yeah. It was. It was terrifying and freeing at the same time. And yeah. um, I, came, I, I was reading that book that you had talked about in your sermon a couple of weeks ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones' Spiritual Depression. Oh. And uh, what, a, what a powerful, very, powerful book. Very powerful book. And he says, this is a quote, but you will never be good enough. Hmm. Nobody has ever been good enough. The essence of the Christian salvation is to say, that he is good enough and that I am in him, yeah. meaning Jesus, right? Yeah. And so there's that moment when I literally realized that when my time on earth is done mm -hmm. and God calls me home and he looks at me, he's not going to see me, he's going to see Jesus yeah. because <laughs> Jesus did it all yeah. and Jesus is enough. Yeah. And that's the only... Yeah, that, that's the essence of that moment, right? Yeah. It's, it's, no, I'm not good enough, mm -mm. but he is. But he is. Right? Yeah. He, he is the definition of good. Mm -hmm. Everything I'm striving in myself, you know, because I'm not my savior. Right. Right? 
He is, right. and he's good. Right. That's that freeing moment. But yeah, I could definitely understand how terrifying that would be. Right. <laughs> trying to, you know, you've built up this house of cards like we all do yeah. that we are. No, here I am. I'm good enough. Look at me. I'm pursuing this and pursuing that. Yeah. And realize we come, we come to the realization that we're not. No. And again, that should drive us to Christ. Yes. Yeah. Should. Should. But there's that fear, like, but it's, you know, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life, right? It's yeah. hard. Sometimes we have this gift, but if we don't open it, yeah. what good is it, <laughs> yes. right? It's not really, a, it's not a gift then. Right. So thanks have, for the gift. Yeah. yeah I mean, another graphic illustration, right? You get a gift and you're just like, oh, thanks. And you put it aside. And yeah. The other person is like, I, aren't you going to open it? Like, yeah. <laughs> I worked really hard on this gift. <laughs> right. It's the gift of God and, and we need to take it and we need to open it and we need to yeah. embrace it. Yeah. Right. Which is what I learned in that moment. Yes. There was a, uh, a poem in your book, mm. which I'd never heard before, and I was very appreciative that you put it in there. Mm. I'm not really a poem guy. I'll be honest with you. Me neither. <laughs> but this was such a cool poem. Yeah. And I'll read it for us, right? And and to give proper citation, yeah, it's called Autobiography in Five Chapters by Portia Nelson or Portia Portia, Portia. Portia Nelson. Yeah. Um, and it's labeled one, two, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. And so one is I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. That's number one. Number two, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes me a long time to get out. Number three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It's my fault. Mm. I get out immediately. Number four, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Mm. And then number five, which I absolutely love, I walk down to another street. Another street. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. But this progression mm-hmm. resonated with me so much because it's that idea. And it's probably something I took from my years of corporate slavery, right? The, <laughs> those four stages of competence yeah right where you are you are not even understanding right unconscious incompetent yeah. i don't even know what i'm doing wrong yeah. i don't even know what i'm doing is wrong mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and then the next stage of conscious incompetence yeah. right that okay i know what i'm doing is wrong it's wrong it's wrong i can't really help myself right right yeah. and then you have the the conscience competence where it's like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna walk around the hole. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. gonna. And then the final stage being unconscious or unconscious unconscious competence, right. where you are just you've changed. Yeah, I'm going like, down a different I'm street. Going down a different street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That really really resonated, and I think one of the key things in that poem too was that it got to that point where it was a change in whose fault it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Did that happen for you? Where it was like. I kind of was like, this is all I know. This is all I know. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I have to change. I have to change. That was during my second hospitalization okay. when I realized like I am either going to die hmm. or I'm, I'm going to conquer this by God's grace. Yeah. And um, that was, that was a, probably the lowest point in my life hmm. ever. You know, I just would stay in my room and cry most of the time in the beginning. Hmm. And they frowned upon that. You know, they wanted you in therapy at every moment. And I was like, very, um, I was not compliant for the <laughs> first time in my life. I can't imagine at that. the age of nineteen. <laughs> but I realized that I needed to do that in order to figure out how to beat this thing. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, and probably in our pre-show notes or, or mm. talking, you know, with each other, um, eating disorders. You know, it's not you. You can live a wonderful, fulfilling life without alcohol. Right. Mm-hmm. You need food. You need food. You have to learn how to deal with it. Yeah. You know, another if if you're addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography, you cannot pick those things up ever again and be fine. Yep. Right. And and there's that all or nothing kind of thing. Which if I could yeah. live without food at that point, I would have been fine. Right. <laughs> Except right. I'd be dead. Right. So. Right, right. Um, yeah. So you wouldn't I, be living. Yeah. Yes. You know. So you have to learn how to deal with it. Yeah. You have to exactly. learn how to. To, you have uh, to learn to know how to take a different street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and so, I was kind of hit 
in the face with that reality. And there was only one way that I was going to get out of that hole, and that was by the grace of God. Yeah. And um, and that's where I met, you know, in that very real sense. Um, and I allowed God to to graciously help me out of that hole. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that idea of picture of reaching up to yeah. Him mm-hmm. to pull me out because I can't do it. Yeah. Right. Right. Trying to do it yourself, trying to do it yourself. And I can't do this. Can't myself. do it. No. Yeah. Cannot do it. There's such a parallel to to progressive sanctification mm-hmm. in in anything, right? right? It's not just um, not just the quote big sins, or the big things we go through, right? But just average, ordinary blocking and tackling growth of the Christian life. Absolutely. Like, let's go back to words. Yeah. Like, wow, I just I use really harsh, terrible words sometimes with people. Yeah. Do I have an eating disorder? Am I an alcoholic? No, I'm not. But like, that's got to change. Yeah. Like that whole, those four stages of growth uh, or the five really in the poem too. Mm -hmm. It's that idea of, okay, you know, when you read that scripture passage, this is what God calls sin. Yeah. I'm aware now Mm -hmm. I'm sinning. Mm -hmm. I can't change it on my own. I need God to help. That's right. And again, yeah. going back to James, right? He even says that anyone who considers himself religious but doesn't keep a tight rein on it, rein on his tongue, yeah, you know, like no, that's that's not going to fly. That yeah. was my translation. That's good. No, <laughs> but it's, um, it's in the Greek. It's yeah. <laughs> so, the, but that's yeah, that's your lifelong struggle with sin and your lifelong um, kind of growth. Yeah. In in the Lord Jesus as yeah. a Christian, we still spend. The, you know, we're preaching through. Genesis yeah, right now here, yeah. and there's still some, we haven't gotten there yet to the Garden of Eden, but there's still so many parallels in that, mm-hmm. right? When Adam and Eve sinned, mm-hmm. the first thing they did was try to cover themselves yeah. up. Yeah. There's, that's, there's so much in there. Oh. And that's what we try to do all the time. I still got this. Yeah. Like, no, I'm covering this. I still got, I am enough. I am enough. No, nope, you're not. I'm not. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Drop the fig leaves. Like, <laughs> it's, it's over. Like, yes. give it up. Yeah. Well, we try to justify ourselves all the time. We try to justify what we're doing and how yeah. we're doing it. And it's just, it's it's filthy rags. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think about that. Instead of uh, sewing fig leaves together, right, to cover themselves, yeah. if they just ran to God and fell down before him in repentance. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, oh, man. I'm not saying theologically it would have changed the rest of the universe, but I'm just saying. I get it. <laughs> what, a, what a heart <laughs> posture change that would have sure. been. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, you say also on page 65 of your book, uh, control is an illusion. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what we're talking about mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you think this is universal? And why do you think we all think that we control more than we actually don't? <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? Control, I looked it up, it's defined as the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And I think we all like to like to believe we can control our circumstances, our environment, um, our our education, our job c- growth. You know, and but that's what America teaches us. It, yeah, we it, can do all that. It's right, up to you, right? But we can't. Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's up to God, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think that's so hard for us, and I think everybody comes face to face with that reality. It's a brick wall at some point. Yeah, you know, it's almost the big lie that we've been taught in this country that you know, do it yourself, customize your life. You yeah. know, whatever you whatever you want to look like, whatever school, your college you want to go to, whatever career you want, whatever right. you're gonna marry, where you live, all that stuff's all up to you. Yeah. And so we have this illusion that we think, oh well, I, I must be in control of everything. And then the brick wall comes. Yeah. In whatever form it is. Yeah. Cancer or whatever, or something happens. COVID. Yeah. Or it's like, wow, punch in the face. Yeah. I'm not in control of right. that. Right. And I love Proverbs. Again, Proverbs, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Yeah. Right. Bottom line is we can plan away, but God has the final say. Yeah. And again, how much better would it be for us to just realize, nope, I'm not in control, yeah. but he is. But he is. And I trust him Yeah. because he's good. Even when it doesn't <clears throat> look good, right. I still trust him. Right. In that. Yeah. Um. I was wondering too that that I was wondering if you see a shift in the American culture um, where it maybe is shifting from I'm in control of all things, right? To maybe as the poem said, it's not my fault. Right. Do you see a shift like where the victim is becoming like the hero? 
in our society where where people know it's not my fault that you know you're using words that are doing me harm mm. so it's your fault mm. that i i'm not in control of yeah. that that's um that's tricky because i do see nobody wanting to take responsibility for anything mm-hmm. anymore and so when things are hard or when life gets tough yeah um, it's much easier to say, well, I'm a victim here mm-hmm. than it is to say, oh, I, I need to work harder yeah. or I, I think I need to change yeah. my plan or my direction or take responsibility for that was a bad decision I made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Instead, it's so much easier to say, oh, I'm a victim and um, I don't like you. Yep. <laughs> and and it yeah. really makes no sense because we can all play that card. Yeah. And that's a huge difference between a biblical worldview yeah. and a secular worldview, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't talk about this, but I'm I'm fairly certain you would not blame. Let's just pick the eating disorder on someone else. Oh goodness, no! You know that's yeah. the Christian worldview comes into play and say, no, that was I listened to the wrong voices. Absolutely, right? and that was idolatry, and that was sin, and I repented, and thank God, right. I I got the help that I needed, and He provided that for me. Yeah, but yet. Yeah. A secular worldview, you could imagine, well, I had an eating disorder because of uh, well, X, Y, Z. Right. All the magazines and all the things that yeah. tell me I need to be thin and I need to... But no, I made that decision. Yeah. Just like the alcoholic makes the decision to pick up the bottle. Yeah. Just like the person looks up porn on their iPad yeah. or whatever. You're yeah. making the decision, right? Yeah. And the decision is was mine. Um, and yeah, I just listened to the wrong voices. Yeah. And... and- We're not saying that there's not contributing factors. Right. Like, sure. Mm -hmm. There could be things. There could be genetic things. Yeah. Like, you know, some people are genetically, whatever, compelled. Mm -hmm. You have these proclivities. Yeah. Whether that is to homosexuality, whether that is to alcoholism or workaholism or any other kind of thing, like uh, proclivities towards materialism. Mm -hmm. Like, I was brought up and had to have the best, so Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to have the best, and that's the way I want to present myself. Right. But the idea then of bringing the biblical worldview to, to bear on that, where mm-hmm. it's like, well, that might not be right. Yeah. And I still need to take responsibility for my own actions. Yes. Yeah. But you're right. Like, what did Adam and Eve do? They ran and hid, right? Yeah. Rather than bore the consequence. Yep. I blew it. Are you saying that's been happening since... Uh, <laughs> since the dawn of time. Since the dawn of time. <laughs> well, maybe just one more question as we kind of uh, land the plane here. This has been so helpful thinking about right the the big reveal of the book right you know enough yeah. subtitle it's not me right <laughs> that's right it's not me it's jesus yeah it's always jesus what does that practically mean like somebody's listening to us talking about this and they realize wow uh, hmm, conviction is upon me i've been walking down that same path listening to those same voices blaming everything else but yet the whole while i'm it's me yeah. And, and I need to repent, yeah. and I need to run to Jesus, and I need to fall on my knees and say, Jesus is enough. Yeah. What does that practically mean, do you think, for somebody? What does it look like in well, someone's life when you can see them saying, Jesus is enough? Um, you need to get on a different street. Mm. You need to change directions. Like, you need to repent. Repentance. Right. Yeah. You need to turn around and find a church body a believing church body where mm. you can grow, mm. get into the Word, study the Word. If you need help, if you need counseling, find a Christian counselor. Mm-hmm. They are, they're out there. Mm-hmm. They're not as accessible as regular counselors, but they are there. Yeah. And it's so important. If you are going to accept the help of Jesus, you need to find a counselor who can show you yeah. practically how to do that. Yep. Um, and get in the Word. Yep. You you must be in, in the Word of God every day, you yeah. know, and pray and ask for help because that He wants us to, right? Yeah. God wants us to, to ask Him for help. Yeah. Um, I think what you said is so important because we can fall victim to, like, the emotional side of that yeah. where we say, that's it, Jesus is enough. Mm. I fall on my face, I cry, I get up. And I make no changes in my life whatsoever. But I had a great mountaintop experience where I said Jesus was enough. And what you just described is so helpful and so good because it's like, okay, what that really looks like Mm -hmm. for Jesus to be enough Mm -hmm. is you need to start making changes. Absolutely. And and I say to people, 
control the stuff you can control. Like yeah. we can't control a lot of things, right? but you can control getting in the word of God. Absolutely. You can control getting to a good church and talking to people, being vulnerable, making relationships. Yeah. You can control getting the help you need yeah. if you need help. Mm -hmm. right? You can control reaching out to other people yeah. and saying, wow, this is me. Can you help me? Yes. And changing your habits. You need to change habits many yeah. times. You need to, what you look up on YouTube needs to change. Yeah. Um, and what you read needs to change and watch for entertainment might yeah. need to change. Like it is a lifestyle change. And there are so many um, in scripture, there's so many references to like running that race with perseverance. Sure. This is a long haul, right? That, that Jesus is enough moment. That is basically the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then the work starts. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Too. That, that now we can get started. Now we can get started. Now <laughs> almost, yeah. you can picture Jesus in his glory, mm. right? Mm. When when a sinner finally just repents and says, you're right, I'm yeah. not enough. Right. And Jesus is, okay, let's get to let's work. Let's go. <laughs> let's start, right? <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I do believe that. And then as you grow in him, it just gets better. Yeah. Harder and better. Harder and better. Right. Yeah. But there have been plenty of illustrations going around, right? The idea of if you want an easy life, right, you make the easy decisions mm -hmm. first, and that leads to a harder life later on. Yeah. But if you want a, a God glorifying life. Yes, these decisions are going to be hard. Yeah, but they're worth it. Absolutely, they're absolutely worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know that you had some Bible verses there. Your your um, book is flooded with Bible verses. Mm. So maybe uh, on a closing note, if you can pick out a couple verses there that were very encouraging and and share them with us, that would be wonderful. I will. Um, there are so many. Right. <laughs> I I. I love, I love reading the Bible, and I love just getting these little um, wisdom verses. But the one, um, one that's that's always been near and dear is that First um, Peter five ten that says, "And the God of all grace, mm -hmm. who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong." firm and steadfast. Mm. And I love that because, um, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You talked about that low point, right? Which yeah. a lot of people have and, yeah. and can relate to, but yeah, don't stay there. Don't he, stay there. Yeah. He can. And, and then when the storm has swept by the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Mm. Cause it's hard, right? Yep. It's walking the Christian life, living the Christian life. It's hard. There's many rewards, yeah. many, many rewards, but it's a long-term commitment. And he's right there with us yeah. all the time. He's helping yeah. us as we walk. So, yeah. yeah, depending on the day, I will give you different verses. But, <laughs> <laughs> but today, those verses pop out. So, good, good. But yeah. yeah. Well, Naomi, thank you so much for taking time out. Thank you for the book. Is there a way that people can purchase this book if they would like to? There certainly is. It's on Amazon. Okay. Um, and it's only on Amazon. So Only on Amazon. That's it. Um, exclusively uh, on Amazon. Exclusively. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's just the title is Enough mm -hmm. and by Naomi Mason, and that's it. And um, I, I just pray that the Lord will use it you know, for his glory yeah. and, and help many people. Um, and I've had the opportunity, like you mentioned, to speak to some women's groups mm -hmm. on the book, and that's mm -hmm. been really helpful to me, and I'm certainly willing to do that as well. Good. But thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you for coming on, and, and uh, just pray that this is helpful. Yeah. I, I have a feeling it will be. Well, I hope that you have found this episode with Naomi Mason and her book, Enough, helpful. I hope that you have realized that you are not enough. And I hope that you have realized that there's only one person that is enough, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. If you'd like to reach out to us at the Mic Check Podcast, you can do so by going to our website, themicecheckpodcast.com, filling out the Contact Us form, or emailing us directly at mike at themicecheckpodcast.com. If you'd like to know more about Highlands Bible church the best way to do that is to come worship with us on a sunday morning the lord's day 9 30 a.m right here in beautiful vernon you can find all details about that on the websites there's only one website highlandsbiblechurch.org 
Once again, I hope you found this helpful. And until next time, keep checking the unbiblical with the biblical. And we'll see you again on The Mike Check.